Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, John. Kathleen and I go back, I hate to say it, more than 40 years. And to see it coming to fruition like this is very gratifying. It would be nice to have another 75 years of life just to do the kinds of things that I could do with this library. So this is what I'm turning over to you. The general overview, the 11,000 plus or minus volumes, 
over 4,000 pamphlets, 1,600 church publications, 140 periodicals, including nearly everything that the church ever published in the English language, 240 dissertations and theses, and then probably the most valuable would be the papers relating to David O. McKay, who arguably was the most important Latter-day Saint of the 20th century. His diaries, 40,000 pages, these scrapbooks not to be overlooked, they're not quite as accessible because they're on uh, microfilm reels, but about 80,000 pages there. These are not in any particular order of emphasis. The evolution of the girls and young women's programs can be documented particularly in the early part of the 20th century. And just by looking at the manuals over time, you can track what is the church's attitude towards girls and young women. The Word of Wisdom, the Dietary Code, 215 documents, several linear feet of American temperance movement documents, all that predate the Word of Wisdom, which was February 27th, 1833. It's significant that February 26th, 1833, the day before, was a National Day of Temperance Celebration. Figure out that. Everything that's in the Word of Wisdom was in the popular culture, but we haven't dug in and really documented that the way that we should. The home mission reports. What did other Christians in the 19th century think of the Mormons? The Baptists, the American Home Missionary Society, and the Presbyterians all published for many, many years home mission bulletins documenting how they were trying to save the, the heathens in the country, which included the blacks, the Mexicans, and the Mormons. The cultural history, there was a private publication called the Mutual Improvement Messenger that every week would publish what are the congregations in the Salt Lake Valley going to present in lesson materials to the youth through the Mutual Improvement Association. I've got 210 issues in this collection over a period of nearly 40 years that allow you to look not just at what were they being taught, but what's being advertised in this area for that 40-year period. Civil disobedience. Helmut Hubner was a 14-year-old during the Third Reich. He appropriated, he and a couple of his friends, the mimeograph machine of their LDS branch to run off anti-Nazi propaganda. He was caught, and as an example, he was beheaded as a 14-year-old. There are 11 volumes, several of them written in German, that deal with the legacy of Helmut Hubner. What was the pop culture of a century ago? There are, in the Relief Society magazines, advertisements guaranteeing that water crocs would be radioactive because it was thought in those early years that radioactivity somehow invigorated you. There are advertisements for 100% wool underwear as somebody who can't even stand a wool sweater over a long sleeve shirt. I cringe when I think about this, but the thought was the irritation is good for you, and that was the popular culture. You can track the hygiene movement of the early 20th century <clears throat> by when we move from the communal sacrament cup to individual water cups. Correlation movement, which began really in 1908 in the aftermath of the Reed Smoot hearings, which Kathleen is the expert on, <clears throat> correlation from then to the present, it became at first a, an organizing principle, but it morphed into the tail wagging the dog the history of the correlation movement and how important that has been on shaping the Mormon experience has yet to be told adequately. BYU speeches of the year <clears throat> have been published since 1951. If you just track who was speaking and what were the topics they were speaking on to the student body of BYU, and you do that over a period of more than 70 years, 
What does that say about how that culture has evolved, particularly the culture of the university and not just the church? LGBTQ plus within Mormonism, many examples of the newsletter of affinity, which was the newsletter of affirmation, affirmation being the oldest LGBTQ support group within the Mormon tradition. Family fellowship was formed by families of gay children to try to be of support to the families and the children. And then there are multiple biographies and autobiographies about LGBTQ people within the Mormon tradition. Utah Lighthouse Ministry, which started out life as modern microfilms. Earlier, one of the speakers talked about Gerald and Sandra Tanner. This was their thing. Gerald, for his entire life, he died of dementia about 20 years ago, I think. Sandra just recently, this year, retired. They published the Salt Lake City Messenger from 1964 to the present, over 41 books. I've talked to Sandra. I think she's quite a lovely person on a personal level, and she said, I'm not an enemy of the church. I'm just trying to keep it honest, and I think she's good for that. The Inherent Racism in Church Curricula and Other Publications. I've talked a lot with Darius Gray about this. He's been on more than one task force within the church to try to, try to go through and examine church published materials. When you are white and are producing these materials, you are colorblind often. And there is some inherent racism in there that the white population doesn't even recognize. How can we recognize that and take it out so that these publications are appropriate for all ethnicities within the church? Just looking at the hymnals over time gives us an idea of how has the culture changed. We hope in a better way. When I was... Um, growing up, so I sang some of these songs and much later realized, hey, either they changed the word or they took them out. The first one, where roamed at will the savage Indian band. And the second one, this is from the hymn for the strength of the hills. I've sung that all my life. But it used to have a verse that said, and the red untutored Indian seeketh here his rude delights. Absolutely unacceptable in today's world, but there it was. If you look at those hymnals over decades and see how we've shifted, wash the Ethiopian white. The oppressor shall die, the Gentiles shall bow beneath thy rod. A lot of militarism in those early hymnals. Long shall his blood, Joseph Smith, which was shed by assassins, stain Illinois while the earth lauds his fame. Now it's plead unto heaven while the earth lauds his fame. Remember the wrongs in Missouri, forget not the fate of Nauvoo. Shall we bear with oppression forever? Shall we tamely submit to the foe while the ties of our kindred they sever? and the bloods of our prophets shall flow. A comprehensive study just of what we have sung over the decades, I think would be very informative of where we have come and maybe where we still need to go. The evolution of ecclesiology. How has this church been governed? When I was growing up, a common theme was, well, you know, we've got it right Nothing really changes. Well, everything changes if you look at it over time. The general handbooks of instruction were published beginning in 1898. The collection has the complete survey of those since 1898. They're the equivalent of Roman Catholic canon law. But in addition to that, there were quasi-official publications, Progress of the Church, came out of the presiding bishop's office, the messenger from 1956 to 62, the priesthood bulletin. These were supplements to the general handbook of instructions. And then you have the church news, which has been the church weekly newspaper from the Deseret News starting in 1933. The collection has a nearly complete run of those. And I think that the copies that aren't there are probably available online. Put all that together and say, how has the governance 
of the LDS tradition evolved over the last century, century and a half. How has the Book of Mormon been viewed and taught over time? It's in transition right now. You hear very little from the pulpit anymore about a historical Book of Mormon, much more emphasis on a, an allegorical Book of Mormon, on the Book of Mormon as a spiritual document and not a historical one. But even with that, the attempt to save an ancient Book of Mormon has been long going. The New World Archaeological Foundation was formed in the early 1950s. I think there are about 70 volumes in the collection that have come out of the New World Archaeological Foundation that morphed early on from trying to prove an ancient Book of Mormon just to do solid archaeological science and some very impressive work that's been done there. More recently, Farms, the Foundation for Ancient Research and Mormon Studies, which morphed into the Neil Maxwell Institute. Faith crisis has been a prominent theme for more than a decade now. I think it really struck a strong note in 2013 when the New York Times in a Sunday front page article described the faith crisis of Hans Matson, who was a high-ranking church official in Sweden and who eventually left the church largely over these unresolved issues relating to the church's history and theology. I was involved in the personal faith crisis survey that began in 2011. It went through several iterations. We collected faith crisis stories along the way. There are four volumes of those that are bound that exist nowhere else except in this collection. So whether you want to look at current iterations of faith crisis or look at it over the past 10 to 20 years, what you really see is the questions that have been tipping people over have not changed much over the past 100 years. What really changed was the democratization of data. When the internet matured, then these data became accessible to everybody. In many cases, whether you liked it or not, you were encountering things or your children were encountering things on the internet. And that tipped people over because they didn't have any context in which to put them to make them understandable. The Mormons was a four hour documentary. By the way, I brought a large poster of that that I had neglected to send when the collection came out. So I think you'll see that later today. That'll be part of the collection. This was a documentary. It was a co-production of the American Experience and Frontline in 2007. The director's cut, the DVDs, are part of the collection. There are only two copies of that. Helen Whitney, who is the producer, has the other copy. And there's some significant differences between the director's cut and the broadcast cut, including the narrator, who was different in the two. And then the transcripts of the interviews that Helen did, five bound volumes of that that exist nowhere else. So a lot of material if you want to look at how that documentary came into being and what's in it. Changing attitudes towards mental health. There are two journals in there that very few people even know exist. AMCAP, the, American, the Association of Mormon Counselors and Psychotherapists, and then the Journal of Collegium Escalapium, indicating where traditional Mormon medicine has gone relative to mental health. The evolution of missiology. How do we as a church that from its earliest days has had a proselytizing outreach how have we responded to changing society in the way that we do missionary outreach? In many ways, we haven't moved very far from where we started, knocking on doors over 190 years ago. But in other ways, we have changed quite a bit. 63 volumes of missionary handbooks, lesson plans, 
if you look at those longitudinally over time, you can see how we have shifted our emphasis in trying to get that message out in a way that it will track proselytes. Then in the early decades of the 20th century, the Elder's Journal and Liahona the Elder's Journal were two monthly publications in two missions of the church that merged to form Liahona the Elder's Journal, and they became the missionary magazines for 40 years. Looking at those, you'll get a good idea of how missiology changed over those decades. The baseball baptisms era was not our brightest era. This began in 1958 when T. Bauer and Woodbury was called to be the president of the British Mission. In the late 1950s in England, anything American was a big deal. England was still struggling to recuperate from the losses of World War II. Americanism was a great thing. These young Mormon missionaries coming from the States immediately attracted attention. Some of them sent home saying, we have one day a week when we can have recreation, send over some baseball equipment. And they just went over to the parks to get their own recreation. These kids had never seen baseball, they'd seen cricket, and they just flocked immediately. So these enterprising missionaries thought, this is a good way for us to have an entree to the families of these young boys. Well, that morphed into, gee, if you want to play baseball with us, here's the initiation right. And it took a dark turn that was emulated in some of the other missions. Part of the uniqueness of this collection is this first item here called Bulletins and Ideas. Uh, I tracked down Bo Woodbury, who's the son of the mission president, and he said, you know, my father kept all the weekly mission bulletins and bound them into a volume about three inches thick. He says, why don't you take that and photocopy it? If you look at those weekly bulletins, you can track how this benign initiative of missionary outreach morphed into something that was quite malignant because the mission president was constantly trying to up the ante. Whatever the productivity of the missionaries was this month, that became the baseline plus 5% or whatever for next month. You can't keep doing that and have a system that doesn't go out of control, and it did go out of control but that story has never been completely tracked down, nor has it been documented adequately enough that this is a theme that keeps recurring in some missions throughout the church because you have mission presidents who think that the way to success in climbing the ladder is through numbers. Mormonism in Great Britain was one of the great success stories the Millennial Star was the longest running church publication 130 years, and it was always published out of Liverpool, England. There is a complete run of the Millennial Star in the collection. Mormon humor uh, sounds like an oxymoron, but there was a period particularly in the 1980s and 90s where we had some rather amazing books of Mormon humor, particularly car cartoon books, Calvin Grandall, uh, was really the starter of this. His titles alone are humorous. Faith Promoting Rumors, Freeway to Perfection, was a play on a book published by Joseph Fielding Smith, one of the church presidents, called The Way to Perfection. Uh, Marketing Precedes the Miracle, play on words of Spencer Kimball's book called Faith Precedes the Miracle. Sunday's Foyer, Utah Sex and Travel Guide, Music and the Broken Word, a play on music and the spoken word. Um, wonderful bits of humor through here. And then at the bottom, for a period of about three years, Mormonism's response to the onion was the sugar beet. I think the sugar beet is no longer available online. 
So by printing it and binding it, I may have something that is at least scarce, if not unique, in there. Tracking the numbers. 1972 until 2013, the church published a, semi or a biannual, or in some cases, an annual church almanac. In its later iterations, it was more than a foot or an inch thick, and it went into great detail, state by state, country by country, describing church programs, putting numbers. In 2013, a physician, David Stewart in Las Vegas, who probably had too much spare time, published a two-volume work called Reaching the Nation's International Church Growth Almanac which took data from the church almanac as its primary database and documented growth or lack of growth throughout the world. It's not a coincidence that the year that that was published was the last year that the church published its church almanac. Nonetheless, you've got 40 years there of amazing numbers that can be used to tell, I think, a much more comprehensive history of the church during the last half of the 20th century than has been told so far. The evolution of the church welfare program, it began in 1936 as a response to the Great Depression. A stake president in Salt Lake City by the name of Harold B. Lee started it as an independent initiative within his stake to try to put people back to work and to grow produce that could be used to feed the people in his stake. That became a church-wide program. There are 40 volumes of welfare handbooks and other welfare-related publications, in addition to the church news and the improvement era that can document what the welfare program has done uh, and what its limitations are when you become a worldwide church, because what you can do in the Great Basin is not the same thing that you can do in Africa or in other undeveloped areas of the world. The local history, uh, Paul talked about tracking down some of the information about black church members. I wonder how much of that is still embedded in local church histories. These are histories that generally don't get out of the church archives, but the Eighth Ward historical record is the record of Elijah Sheets, who holds the all-time record for tenure as a Mormon bishop, 56 years. I don't, or I don't think it's anybody is likely to ever break that one. Um, Sheets was the great-grandfather of Bill Marriott, and because I mentioned to Bill that I knew about this, he eventually came to me and said, look what they sent me, and it was four rolls printed out of uh, microfilm rolls of the Eighth Ward. He said, I don't know what to do with this. So I went through and did an extraction of it, taking all of the interesting stuff, printing it out, binding it. But one of the earliest records in there gives you a glimpse at how the people at the grassroots made this work. History, as we heard earlier, has usually been told top down. Usually it's been the great men, great events, not even the great women getting into the narrative. The success of Mormonism, as I understand it, was the people in the trenches making it work. It wasn't the people at the top. They benefited because it was the grunts in the trenches. So you have this trial before the bishop's court in 1856. Charles King and Amira Tufts. Charge is preferred. The complainant, Charles King, says that Amira Tufts owes him two dollars for setting two tires on her wagon wheels, which she refuses to pay him. The court heard the evidence that was given and decided that Mrs. Tuft pay the complainant one dollar and take each other by the hand and live their religion. That's how they did it. And those 19th century historical records are loaded with the wisdom and the stories of people who are making it work. I had a discussion with Marlon Jensen, who was the church historian, and I said, you could populate church instructional manuals for the next hundred years without ever repeating yourself just by drawing material from these records. 
So if you start with what's in this collection, it also gives you a spring forward for what to look for if you decide to go out to Salt Lake and look at the more extensive collections there. And then finally, just a pitch for the importance of oral histories. I haven't much in the oral histories of this collection, although I did put Helen's oral histories relating to her documentary. If you're doing something relative to the current church, then it's essential that you learn how to do oral histories right because they become an absolutely crucial part of the puzzle that you're trying to put together. So that's my summary of, that's what, 28 slides? There are at least 28 dissertations sitting there for those who are enterprising enough, and probably a lot more if you find what I didn't find in the time that I had to look at it. So questions on that? Okay.